Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the A-level biology topics. The topic is mitosis, meiosis and reproduction. Topic 3b1, the cell cycle. What are chromosomes? Chromosomes are coils of DNA as well as protein. They carry the genetic information within a cell. If cells are not actively dividing, we cannot be able to see or identify the chromosomes easily. However, if cells are actively dividing, the chromosomes are going to be condensed and therefore they become shorter and denser and they can take up stain in order to be visible. In the chromosome, DNA winds around proteins called histones and these are the ones that cause the formation of the dense clusters and these are called the nucleosomes. Within the human DNA, we have 46 chromosomes. Moving on to the cell cycle, cells usually divide and this leads to growth as well as a sexual reproduction, that is if division is by mitosis. The cell cycle is broken down into the interface stage, we go to mitosis stage, and then to cytokinesis when the cells do separate. So in interface, there is no cell division. However, the cells take up substances and they're going to increase in mass as well as size. During this stage, cells also make more organelles as well as the replication of DNA so that the cell is ready to divide and produce cells that are genetically identical. And again, here I'm referring to mitosis. Then after interface, we go to mitosis. This is a period of active cell division. And as we'll see later, it's broken down into prophase, metaphase, anaphase, as well as telophase. And lastly, we go to cytokinesis. This is when the cells actually separate. Different cells have different cell cycles, and this can vary from a few hours to weeks as well as years. And actually, some cells do not divide at all. These include the brain cells. Some cells rapidly divide, like the skin cells, go through rapid cell divisions in order to regenerate the cells that have been worn out. Like I said already, the cell cycle is broken down into interphase, mitosis as well as cytokinesis. Interphase is divided into three phases. There is the G1, there is the S as well as the G2. During the G1, the cell takes up material, grows and increases in size. And when we go to S, this is when the chromosomes do replicate in order to produce enough genetic material that can be shared between two cells. In G2, this is when the organelles as well as other cell materials that are needed for cell division are going to be synthesized. So we're going to move to mitosis as well as cytokinesis. In topic 3b2, we're going to look at mitosis. Mitosis, these are complex series of movements that occur during cell division as the chromosomes compete for space at the middle of the cell as well as being pulled apart in order to separate towards the opposite ends in order to end up in two different cells. During mitosis, the daughter cells produced are genetically identical. Mitosis is broken down into prophase, metaphase, anaphase, as well as telophase. Mitosis is very significant in growth as well as replacement of old cells. You can see that here. And then mitosis is also a method of asexual reproduction. This is where organisms that cannot reproduce sexually produce offsprings because the offsprings are going to be genetically identical, so that occurs through mitotic cell division. A sexual reproduction using mitosis can be advantageous if our aim is to produce offsprings that are genetically identical, maybe if those organisms produce a specific molecule that's beneficial. However, the downfall is environmental changes can affect the survival of the organisms that reproduce asexually. The first stage in mitosis is prophase. During prophase, the chromosomes consist of two sister chromatids, and these sister chromatids are going to be attached at the centromere. The nucleolus is going to break down, and then the centrioles move to opposite sides of the cell. We can see the centrioles are here, and there is no nuclear membrane. Then next we go to metaphase. During metaphase, the chromosomes compete for and align at the metaphase plate. Each chromosome aligns individually because there is no pairing. Again, this is mitosis. The spindle fibers attach to the chromosomes via the centromere, and each chromatid is associated with a separate microtubule spindle fiber in preparation for what's going to occur in anaphase. So in anaphase, the spindle microtubules pull the sister chromatids apart by dividing the centromere. Spindle fibers, these are made up of overlapping microtubules of contractile fibers, and these contract using ATP in order for the chromatids to be moved to the opposite sides of the cell. Next, we go to telophase. During telophase, the sister chromatids have now become in video chromosomes. The spindle fibers break down. You can see the spindle fibers are no longer visible. 
the nuclear envelope forms around the chromosomes. Again, we see the envelope has reformed. The centrioles are going to be reformed and the chromosomes become less condensed and become harder to see. And the final stage of the cell cycle is cytokinesis. This is when the cytoplasm actually divides in order to produce two daughter cells. In animal cells, a ring of contractile fiber tightens, we can see here. It tightens around the center. It looks like a belt tightening around the sac of flower. It continues to contract until the two cells have been separated. However, in plant cells, it's a different story because the cellular cell walls, we can see these are remains of organelles that are going to be filled with cellulose in order to form a cell wall that separates the two cells. Moving on to topic 3p3, sexual reproduction and meiosis. During sexual reproduction, offsprings are going to be produced by the fusion of specific gametes. So sexual reproduction is going to produce offsprings that are not genetically identical to their parents because the gametes are produced through meiosis. Sexual reproduction usually involves special sexual organs. This is both in plants as well as animals. And sexual reproduction is believed to increase genetic variation, and this is going to improve survival of offsprings if environmental conditions do change. Moving on to gametes, human body cells are diploid. However, gametes are haploid, meaning they have half the number of chromosomes. During sexual reproduction, two haploid gametes or two haploid nuclei are going to fuse, and a zygote is going to be produced. So this zygote is going to be a diploid because two haploids came together, and that process is called fertilization. Moving on to formation of gametes, of course, gametes are going to be formed in special sex organs. This is going to vary from animals as well as plants. In simpler plants and animals, sometimes sexual organs are going to be formed only when needed. However, in complex animals, the sex organs are usually going to be more prominent, and sometimes they're called the gonads. So in flowering plants, the female organs are going to be the ovaries, and the males are going to be the anthers. The female gametes are the ovules, however, the male gametes are going to be contained within spores, called pollen. Moving to animals, the male gonads are the testes and these produce the male gametes which are the spermatozoa. The female gonads are ovaries and these produce the female gametes known as the ovar. Meiosis is a reduction cell division meaning it produces half the number of chromosomes compared to those found in body cells. In animal gametes are going to be produced directly through the process of meiosis so there is going to be variation and this could lead to evolution or changes that we see in specific offsprings. In meiosis, there are two cell divisions, and these produce four haploid daughter cells, each with unique combinations of genetic material because there are two processes. One is called crossing over, and the other is called independent assortment. So we're going to be looking at meiosis 1 as well as meiosis 2. In meiosis 1, we'll look at prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, and telophase 1, accompanied by cytokinesis. So in prophase 1, we can see the chromosomes are condensed and they can take up stain, that's why they're visible. Then the centrioles move to opposite side of the cell. We can see they're moving to opposite side and the spindle fibers are forming between them. Also crossing over occurs during prophase 1. Crossing over is when non-sister chromatids exchange genetic material and this process is controlled by enzymes that cut the specific areas of the non-sister chromatids in order to create various combinations. In metaphase 1, the chromosomes move to the metaphase plate. We can see they're aligned there. And the homologous pairs are going to be aligned together, meaning if this is from the father, that is going to be from the mother. And if this is chromosome 1, that is going to be its homologous pair. Spindle fibers attach to the centromere of each chromosome. And of course, these fibers are going to be different so that during anaphase, they can pull away separately. During metaphase 1, independent assortment occurs, meaning the chromosomes fight or compete for the metaphase plate, but there are various combinations that can occur during this composition. I'll demonstrate this a little bit later. During anaphase 1, the homologous pairs are pulled to opposite ends of the cell due to contraction by the spindle fibers. Here, the centromere does not divide because the sister chromatids are not separated during anaphase 1. It's just the homologous pairs that are pulled apart. Moving on to telophase 1, as well as cytokinesis, here the spindle fibers are going to break down the chromosomes will gather at the opposite poles, and then the cytoplasm will begin to divide. Then during cytokinesis, the cytoplasm will fully divide. Moving on to meiosis 2. Again, this is similar to what we saw in meiosis 1. However, in prophase 2, there is no crossing over, and in metaphase 2, there is no independent assortment. 
So here we see the centromeres are moving to the opposite side, the spindle fibers are visible, the chromosomes are also visible because they can take up stain due to the condensing that has occurred. In metaphase 2, the chromosomes align at the metaphase plate and the spindle fibers are attached to the centromere. Here there is no pairing, unique chromosomes align individually. And in anaphase 2, we see there is contraction of the spindle fibers and then the sister chromatids are going to be pulled apart. And in telophase 2 and cytokinesis, we see the cell beginning to divide and the nuclear envelope is going to be reformed. Like we said before, meiosis is reduction division and it produces gametes that are haploid so that when they fuse, we can produce diploid offsprings. This ensures that the number of chromosomes in the offsprings is maintained to 46 if we are talking about the humans. Meiosis is the main way in which variation is introduced in species because of crossing over as well as independent assortment. I've already talked about this. However, sometimes questions can come asking about variation. So please remember, random fertilization also leads to variation and the mutations that could occur during the two stages of meiosis, these could also lead to variation. So variation occurs due to crossing over, independent assortment, random fertilization, as well as mutations. Moving on to crossing over, like we already say, this occurs in prophase one. Here, enzyme complexes are going to cut and join bits of maternal and paternal chromatids. These are the non-sister chromatids. They're going to be cut at the region called the chasma. So we can see the enzymes cut there, and then we see these combinations due to crossing over. The points where this happens are called the chasmata, and this exchange of genetic material leads to variation, and sometimes errors do occur, which is mutation. Independent or random assortment occurs in metaphase 1 of meiosis. As chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate, this is going to be randomly distributed and there are various combinations that can occur. If I use this example, we can see we have one blue and two reds at this side, while we have two blues here. However, it could be two blues here, one blue this side. Depending on how the arrangement occurs during metaphase 1, we're going to have various combinations within the offsprings. Moving on to topic 3b4, gametes, structure and function. We look at gamete formation in mammals. We know that these gametes are the ones that make sexual reproduction possible. And for gametes to be formed, mitosis occurs in order to produce the precursor cells or the cells that are going to be used in meiosis in order to produce the haploid gametes. And this is what we call gametogenesis. Again, mitosis provides the precursor cells, and then meiosis causes the reduction that leads to formation of the haploid gametes. In females, mitotic division occurs before birth to form the diploid primary oocyte, which remains inactive until puberty. When they hit puberty, then meiosis can continue in order to produce the secondary oocyte. And this secondary oocyte completes meiotic division when the head of the sperm touches the membrane of the secondary oocyte. The male gametes, which are the spermatozoa, these contain an acrosome where we have digestive enzymes, and then they contain a nucleus, which is going to be haploid. They contain mitochondria in the middle piece, which is going to provide energy for the lashing of the tail. This energy is going to be ATP, of course. And then the tail that is made up of microtubules that form wimp-like movements to ensure that the mature sperm remains in suspension as it moves towards the ovum. Moving on to the female gamete, here we have the secondary oocyte. It has the zona pellucida, which is a clear layer of protection that surrounds the oocyte. And then we can see it has a cytoplasm, which contains a lot of food reserves. It has a membrane, and then we have genetic material inside. Of course, the female gamete is going to be bigger in comparison to the male gamete. Gamete formation in plants occurs in two phases of the plant life cycle. There is the sporophyte generation as well as the gametophyte generation. The sporophyte generation, like we see here, is going to be diploid. And this is going to produce the spores, which are these ones here, through meiosis. And then those spores are going to go through mitosis in order to produce the gametes. And then the gametes are going to fuse in order to produce the zygote, which is going to be diploid again, we can see here. Moving on to the pollen grain, this contains two haploid nuclei. We can see there is the pollen tube nucleus as well as the generative nucleus. The generative nucleus is later going to divide by mitosis to produce the two male nuclei, which are going to participate in the fusion in order to produce either the endosperm or the zygote. We also see the cell surface membrane. There is a thick resistant cell wall as well as a cytoplasm. The embryo sac, which we see here, contains eight nuclei and seven cells. We can see these three are cells and these three are cells. These are going to fuse together to produce kind of a diploid cell. So you can see 
we have three, three, and then one, creating the seven cells. The three antipodal cells are rich in lipids, and these supply nutrients, which are required for the gametophyte as well as during the embryo development. And the two polar nuclei, these are going to fuse with one male nucleus in order to produce a three n endosperm or a triploid endosperm. This endosperm will provide nourishment during germination. The two synergates direct the pollen tube towards the egg cell. And then the egg cell is going to fuse with one male nucleus in order to produce the zygote. Moving on to topic 3b5, fertilization in mammals as well as plants. Formation of the ovum. This part is not emphasized a lot in your textbook, but there is some little information written in there, and I think it's wise for me to show you what actually happens. This is formation of the ovum in animals, and this ovum is going to be the secondary oocyte. So before birth, we're going to see mitosis occur. There are primordial cells that are going to go through mitosis to produce so many other cells, and meiosis is going to begin from some of these cells, and it will stop in prophase 1. After puberty, meiosis is going to continue until the secondary oocyte is going to be formed. However, this phase is going to remain at metaphase 2, which we see in the secondary oocyte. When ovulation occurs, then the sperm touches the membrane of the secondary oocyte. That initiates the second meiotic division to be completed, and then fertilization is going to occur. During the first stage in meiosis, we produce one polar body. This polar body is haploid, however, it has 46 chromosomes since the sister chromatids are not separated. This could go further to divide, however, whatever comes out of that division is going to degenerate. Also at this stage when the second meiotic division is completed, there is another polar body produced which is haploid and actually this is also going to degenerate. And then whatever remains is just going to be one haploid that is going to be fertilized by the sperm in order to produce the diploid zygote. During fertilization in humans, the ovum is just going to be viable for a few hours in order to receive the male gamete for fertilization to occur. However, the sperm can survive within the female reproductive tract for a day or more. As soon as the head of the sperm touches the surface of the ovum, acrosome reactions are going to occur. Here, the acrosomes of the many sperms are going to release enzymes, and these enzymes are going to digest the follicle cells as well as the zona pellucida. Eventually, one of the sperms is going to wiggle its way through here in order to touch the membrane of the secondary oocyte, and this almost causes instantaneous changes because the charge is going to be reversed. Before its negative inside in comparison to the outside, however, after the head of the sperm touches the membrane, it becomes positive inside in comparison to the outside. Also, when the sperm touches the membrane of the oocyte, then the second meiotic division is going to be completed in order for the cell to fully become haploid for fertilization to occur. And again, during fertilization, we've talked about the acrosome reactions. Then after that, the cortical reactions are going to occur. In cortical reactions, the cortical granules are going to be released from the secondary oocyte, and these are going to combine with the zona pellucida in order to make it impenetrable to more sperm to prevent polysperming. Moving on to dial fertilization in plants. Like we said already, the embryo suck has seven cells as well as eight nuclei. We have the antipodal cells that provide nourishment. We have the two nuclei fused together to create one cell. These are going to fuse with one of the male nucleus in order to produce the endosperm. And then the other male nucleus is going to fertilize the egg in order to produce the zygote. The pollen grain will land on the stigma. The pollen grain contains two nuclei. One is a generative nucleus and the other is the pollen tube nucleus. The pollen tube nucleus causes the production of enzymes and these enzymes will digest the tissues of the style in order to provide nourishment as well as a pathway for the pollen tube. The generative nucleus will go through mitotic division in order to produce identical two male nuclei. Then fertilization is going to occur, like I've already explained here, in order to give us two. One is the zygote and the other is going to be the endosperm. So this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.